Coming up on DTNS, Waymo pulls the safety driver from its autonomous cars. Google Stadia talks about something called negative latency and the complicated mess of U.S. tech companies in China. We'll be doing that again, won't we? <laughs> oh, there we go. You decided not to work that time. All right. Let me delete that file. <laughs> That read sucked anyway, Tom. It's for the yeah, best. I could, I could, I could do better. That's <laughs> it, step it up. Step it up. It was uh, <laughs> what the heck? No, Dropbox. That's not what I want to do. Um, yeah, it wasn't the uh, the technical issue. It really was. I was just disappointed in myself. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. It's it's good. It's good to hold yourself to a high standard. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. In three, two. Coming up on DTNS, Waymo pulls the safety driver from its autonomous cars. Google Stadia talks about something called negative latency and the complicated mess of U.S. tech companies in China. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 9th, uh, October 10th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From the still-powered Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Yes. So you are not in a region uh, being unplugged in Northern California. If people don't realize uh, PG&E having to do some rolling blackouts again. It's like the early 2000s all over uh, to prevent fire risk. Uh, but you, you've escaped it so far, Justin. I don't believe that we are on the map, although considering the fiasco that has already gone on, who knows, Tom? Well, folks, if you want to hear Justin's opinion on Galaxy's Edge uh, briefly or a lot of talk about baseball and college football conferences, you got to get good day internet, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start here with a few tech things you should know. Amazon announced Amazon Music is now available on Apple TVs, uh, running tvOS at 12.0 or later in the U.S., the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Canada, France, Italy, Spain, Germany, Mexico, Japan, and India. As the companies continue to play nice or keep antitrust arguments at bay, Apple's upcoming TV Plus streaming service also includes availability on the Fire TV. Genetics testing company Color Genomics will supply information from genetic tests to Verily Life Sciences ba baseline health study participants. Verily is owned by Alphabet. Color Genomics does physician ordered testing. Users take samples at home and then get a phone call about their results. Board certified genetic counselors and pharmacists assist risks for certain cancers, heart disease, and genes that can affect medication responses. Verily hopes that offering color genomics service will encourage more people to join the baseline health study, which aims to map overall population health. OnePlus announced the OnePlus 7T Pro. It's going to cost you 699 pounds coming to the UK October 17th. The Pro has a bigger screen, 6.67 inch QHD plus OLED screen. It wraps around the side. Remember, there's no notch because it's got the pop-up camera, just like the 7T. Otherwise, Similar in specs to the OnePlus 7T. Uh, it's just that that pretty screen for the most part. Uh, there's also a McLaren edition of the OnePlus 7T Pro in black and orange with 12 gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage for 799 pounds. That one arrives in the UK November 5th. The University of Maine and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory collaborated on the world's largest 3D printer. How large is it? It is 70 feet long with a planned extension that will make it 100 feet long. To demonstrate it, the university took 72 hours to print out a 25-foot, 5,000-pound boat, now holding the record of the world's largest 3D-printed boat. Pretty cool. U.S. Senators Susan Collins and Angus King took the boat out on the water in the university's giant indoor ocean simulator to prove it was seaworthy. Some joke in there about two politicians in a boat, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, we'll leave that as an exercise for the audience. Uh, let's talk a little more about Waymo, Jerry. Indeed. Waymo sent out an email advising customers in the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona, that autonomous cars with no human safety driver will soon be available in the area. Waymo One users will receive a notification if a fully driverless car has been dispatched. While the car will not have a safety driver, TechCrunch notes that a Waymo employee may be in the car initially, and the email from Waymo says a rider support agent will be available at any time during the ride through the car's help button or through the Waymo app. 
Previous Waymo service in the Phoenix area always had a human safety driver in the car. I mean, anybody who's in the area who's already been, you know, part of the program will understand that the autonomous test has been ongoing. But imagine having someone in the car, but they're just like in the back seat with you, and they're like, "Yeah, no, I'm not a safety driver. I'm just, I'm just here just to make sure everything's cool still." Yeah, I want you to fill <laughs> out the healthy. survey. I'm in marketing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a, this is a big milestone though, and and the first thing that occurred to me is is not about safety. It's like these guys have folks have been using Waymo One in Phoenix uh, have been in these cars and seen how they work. They're gonna be un, they're gonna be unafraid of this. I think my question is where do you sit if you're the only person in the car now? Do you sit in the driver's seat to make it look more natural, Ooh, or do you you know sit question. in the back? Yeah, I'm I I I'm, I would you know I never really thought about that. I think maybe I would sit in the driver's seat just to be like. In the event of an emergency, at least I could like put the brake pedal on, kind Maybe. of thing. Mm. I, I don't know, know if I'd even be allowed to do that. Yeah, can you can you manually override uh, uh, the car? Well, I mean, anybody else who's a safety driver would presumably be able to do I that. I imagine that might be disabled in these cases. I don't perhaps, know. Perhaps, perhaps, yeah, yeah, because you're not supposed to be, you know, fussing with the with with the grid. We have questions, Arizonans. TVZ gone. Right in these. <laughs> Google Stadia, like any game streaming service, wants to make sure that it has as low a latency as possible so that most gamers don't feel like it's different from playing a game locally. In an interview with Games Radar's Edge magazine, Stadia's VP of Engineering, Maj Bakar, said, quote, Ultimately, we think in a year or two, we'll have games that are running faster and feel more responsive in the cloud than they do locally. He used a term called negative latency that would be achieved by running at a super fast frame rate to act on player inputs earlier, predicting button presses and buffering actions. Bacar was comparing Stadia's potential to a console running at 30 frames per second using a wireless controller. Yeah, so part of this is a little bit of <clears throat> word magic uh, saying like, oh, we'll have a higher frame rate, so it'll have less latency than something that doesn't have as high of a frame rate. It's like, well, that would be true for a console too, but... The idea of using machine learning to anticipate what you might do and send those actions down the pipe and have them at the ready for when you do it, that's the kind of thing that machine learning is really good at. That's the kind of thing that would definitely be able to overcome the like physical limitations of, of broadband. Well, that's I guess pretty even clever. though negative latency is sort of a silly term, that's what it would be. That would, exactly. It's like you can joke about negative latency, but negative latency joke is it's going to know what I want to do before I do it. Yeah. That's what they're describing. Look, the, the question that I would put to you, Tom, is is this a press release or is this something that we believe the technology is here for and could happen? Because rest assured, folks, Google Stadia relies on the latency question. It will either solve this or it will die. I think that there is the theoretical possibility, and I'm sure that Google has a working model of this that they're not ready to implement. And that's why he's saying one to two years from now. I think him saying this in the interview is definitely resetting the goal line of saying, yeah. everybody's gonna complain about the current latency. Let me retarget their anger towards complaining about me saying negative latency and how off, how stupid that is and it'll never work. And then they won't be complaining about the current latency. This thing's gonna launch in November. We'll have the answer to the current latency you know, in a month or so. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a great sign, though, that, that they're like, oh, no, don't worry. We're already pre-fixing the problem we know you're going to all complain about. The fact that, look, streaming services will always suffer from this until they don't. And then they will be, uh, you know, they will they will have that limitation on them until they are able to play it as if it were a physical console right in front of you. There is a psychological aspect to knowing it will get better, though, right? And so is you're not... You're never going to well, cut yeah. out. Yeah. The, you're never going to cut out all the complaints, but if you can have some people not complaining because they're like, "Well, it's not too bad," and he said it in a couple of years, it'll be negative latency. No, 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 no. If it's if it's good and you have a promise that it will be better than good, then you're happy. Right. right? If it's bad and someone's selling you, "Oh no, don't worry." Just remain a subscriber for the next year to two years, and it'll uh, we will turn the corner at that point. That becomes that that starts rubbing people the wrong way. I think they think <laughs> when I say they, I mean Google. Yeah, that it is good enough that you shouldn't complain. 
but they're not worried about how good it actually is. They're worried about perception. So this is all a battle for setting perceptions uh, and saying, because people who go in and decide this is not going to be good enough are going to see latency even where there isn't any, right? There's going to be they some are, some weirdness and they're going to blame the latency. So they are painting it red and saying, all right, even if you're like, okay, negative latency is a ridiculous concept and this is a stupid thing to say, what they want you on the other end to be to be talking to your friends about is, yeah, but it's good now. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know why. I mean, I don't know. I guess negative latency might be ridiculous, but it's pretty good now. I don't know. I, I kind of barely notice it. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that's going to work, but I feel like that's kind of what they're doing. And I also, but I also don't think it's entirely vaporware. I, Google is good enough with machine learning that this seems plausible, that there could be some machine learning algorithm that maybe even could send a couple of different anticipations down the pike. Like, well, most people do this or that, so we'll buffer both of those. And then when you actually make the choice, it has both of them at the ready for you. I mean, if there is any company that certainly knows enough about server traffic, it is Google. Yeah. Uh, and machine learning, both. Yeah. Uh, Rwanda's Mara Group released two Android smartphones this week. Mara manufactures all of the parts of the phone itself, including the motherboards, but also the packaging. So this thing is the first smartphone manufacturer that can truly claim its phones are entirely made in Africa. A lot of phones are assembled in Africa, but these phones are made from the ground up in Africa. The Mara X has 16 gigabytes of storage, sells for 120,250 Rwandan francs, that's 130 bucks US. The Mara Z comes with 32 gigabytes of storage, and that one sells for a little more, 175,750 Rwandan francs, about 190 bucks US. Puts them a bit more expensive than the most popular brand in large parts of Africa, which is Techno. That's a Chinese brand. Uh, if you've been following the Chinese market at all, you know that Techno's kind of become the dominant brand uh, across the continent. But I think Rwanda just wants to do this as a demonstration, uh, but also they're hoping they're, at least in the country of Rwanda, there might be a little local pride causing people to plop down a little more on these. I just think it is remarkable that Africa has, for the last you know decade and a half, uh, been at the forefront of some of the most innovative uses of cell phones and credits and, and stuff like that. Granted, oftentimes it comes because of hardship situations that they need to uh, get around or instability in certain regions. But I think that that Africa has always been something that I've I've, I've looked at with uh, great enjoyment as they've uh, innovated and made new uh, headways in in all cell technology. Yeah, and uh, if if I don't know, twenty years ago we we were doing DTNS, we probably would have done a story about the first manufacturing plant in China to to make electronics, and it, it would have sounded like this. So you know, keep an eye on this. So go ahead and keep an eye on for the twenty years from now the yeah. uh, weighty main topic that we'll have about uh, our relationship with Africa. <laughs> yeah, and make sure you're at the co-executive producer level so you can look <laughs> have us look at this lineup five years from now and talk about it then. Hey, a new survey conducted by Ofcom of 150,000 mobile phone users in the UK between January and March this year shows that Liverpool residents have longer phone calls than residents of other major UK cities. Liverpuchians spend an average of six minutes and 51 seconds on a single call. Londoners came in second with 40% less time spent on the phone. What are you guys talking about, Liverpool? Uh, uh, Bradford <laughs> folks kept the shortest amount at 3 minutes and 15 seconds. However, the surveys did not include calls made on Skype, WhatsApp, or other VoIP services. Notably, the research found people predominantly use their phones over Wi-Fi with mobile data services such as 3G and 4G used less than a third of the time. You know, I at first I was like, okay, well, this is sort of interesting. I wonder what it is about this particular region, and you know, maybe maybe they're, uh, you know, the 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 immigrant community maybe talking to people at home. Maybe that has something to do with it. Until I was like, oh wait, we're not talking about Skype or WhatsApp or any other oh. VoIP service. We're just talking about, uh, you know, phone calls made over 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 three G or four G networks within the UK. That is. A little bit harder to swallow. Well, or Wi-Fi. I mean, it, a lot of the or phone that. calls made yeah. over Wi-Fi. Uh, but sure. yeah, we're we're talking about using the phone app, not using a messaging app. Uh, they did they did point out in this study that uh, the time spent on voice calls overall fell for the first time in 2018, and they think that's because more 
especially younger users, are messaging. They're not calling. So I yeah. don't know if you include WhatsApp and Skype voice calls, whether it makes that much of a difference on this, because it's it's a dying art to actually call someone. Uh, as we've talked about before, sometimes it's rude to just call someone. You're supposed to text first and say, is it okay if I call you? Yeah. All right. So uh, undoubtedly, we are talking to people right now in Liverpool. And uh, apologies if you had to have this podcast broken up by a seven minute phone call from somebody. But uh, I need to know what are, I mean, is do you guys notice that you guys call each other more or talk for longer than, than people in other regions? Well, Nick with a C says, as a Brit, Liverpoolians are the most talky people here. Uh, and very kindly did not uh, correct uh, our, our, our pronunciation of Liverpoolian earlier. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> it's uh, apparently a stereotype. That he's, they're the I most don't think Nick is they're Liverpoolian, the most though. Most talky folk. That is interesting. Well, I don't know. Well, London, it's like it's like. I mean, you look think at of it like in the U.S. Like, what it what would be the you know the, you know something that we could equate here? It's like I don't know if there's I, a regionalism. Like I don't. I mean, I I would never be like. Well, you know, Justin Robert Young knows that all those Floridians are just on the phone all day long. I mean, we just <laughs> we just don't talk about stuff like that. It's not. It's it's. If you look at this graph, it's almost flat. I mean, there is a difference yeah. between London and Bradford, but it's a it's a nice even curve going through Leeds, Birmingham, Edinburgh, Manchester, Bristol, Sheffield, Cardiff, all the way down to Bradford. Liverpool is off the charts more. Uh, I feel like, yeah, maybe Angelinos uh, talk a little bit longer because of the California drawl or something. <laughs> no, this is no, the, that's, I, that I, is it's not laughable, an actual right? thing. There isn't a real stereotype like that that we could we could point out over here. No, yeah. and apologies to all of Liverpool for murdering Liverpool. <laughs> Well, uh, Liverpudlians, uh, if you have some insight, please let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. All right, moving on. Bloomberg reports that Amazon uses teams in both India and Romania to review clips captured by its CloudCam security cameras that are submitted by CloudCam users for troubleshooting. Video clips are then reviewed to help improve the performance of machine learning algorithms used to detect issues from unrecognized people to crying babies or smoke, for example. Video clips are typically 20 to 30 seconds in length. Amazon says that any clips with inappropriate content are discarded and then not used the to uh, further train the AI. The cloud cam teams, cloud cam teams and conditions state that uh, terms and conditions rather state that Amazon reserves the right to process images, audio and video captured by device devices to improve its products and services kind of boilerplate stuff. In a Q&A about cloud cam on the web, Amazon did say, quote, only you or people you have shared your account information with can view your clips unless you choose to submit a clip to us directly for troubleshooting. Now, Bloomberg's article does kind of hint around that maybe clips are showing up that weren't submitted for troubleshooting, but they don't have any smoking guns there. Yeah. Uh, there's just sort of some suppositions. So short of a report that confirms that, this doesn't feel like much of a story when it's like, hey, there's a team that when you send your video clip for troubleshooting looks at that video clip, but they don't specifically say in the terms that it would be a human. I mean, I, so, okay. I mean, you know what we need, and maybe DTNS is the body to launch it, is just some kind <laughs> of like code of ethics that all these companies that w in these situations where you're feeding back either audio or video, for uh, uh, improval or uh, improvement on the service that we just know, okay, this is how it's gonna go. This is how it's gonna be randomized. We are pledging to do this because all these stories that keep coming out are are all in various different goalposts shifting like, oh, well, this is, these are, are being reviewed by humans. These are being uh, 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 you know, anonymized on some level. There's just no standard for us and I think for consumers to know okay, this company is being reckless. This company is going above and beyond of what they should be doing. Like, I, yeah, what's the standard? Because to me, th this is very clearly like, yeah, all, if, you, if you didn't catch it, folks, only when you send your clip to Amazon for troubleshooting yes. does a person employed by Amazon look at it and use it to upgrade the uh, machine learning that runs this. That's it. it this is not... It's doing it without your permission. And the only smoking gun Bloomberg has in this story is, but it doesn't say it's a human. Like, okay, did I guess you expect that it would always be a machine? But no, I don't I don't know that that's that bad. So yeah. 
Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Earlier this month, Apple rejected the app HK Map Live, which crowdsourced locations of police and tear gas in Hong Kong and displayed them on a map. We talked about that. Then last week, Apple changed its decision and decided to allow the app to be published in the App Store in Hong Kong. We talked about that. Tuesday, a state-run newspaper in China called Apple an accomplice in Hong Kong protests for allowing the app to be published. We talked about that yesterday. Now, Apple has removed the app from the store as well as a mirror app called Backup HK. Previous installed versions still work, as does a web-based version of Hong Kong Map Live, but Apple flip-flopped. Here's why. Apple put out a statement saying, many concerned customers in Hong Kong contacted the company about the app, and the app displays police locations, and we have verified with the Hong Kong Cybersecurity and Technology Crime Bureau that the app has been used to target and ambush police, threaten public safety, and criminals have used it to victimize residents in areas where they know there is no law enforcement. So Apple's saying this is being used to commit crimes. That violates our terms, and we're pulling the app. Also, Apple CEO Tim Cook uh, sent an email to Apple employees that is now leaked out, saying that while the information in the app was on its own benign, the company had credible information from the Hong Kong police, as well as Apple users, that the app was being used, quote, maliciously to target individual officers for violence and to victimize individuals and property where no police are present. This use put the app in violation of Hong Kong law. Similarly, widespread abuse clearly violates our app store guidelines barring personal harm. So that email kind of narrows it and says, maybe this was being used to target individual police people, not just saying, hey, the police are here. You might want to avoid that street, which it definitely was being used for, too. But Apple's saying it was also being used for this other thing. Uh, Tim Cook's email continues to say national and international debates will outlive us all. And while important, they do not govern the facts. In this case, we thoroughly reviewed them and we believe the decision best protects our users. Now, Apple's not alone, nor is HK Map. Developers of the app said moderators were deleting content that solicited criminal activity and banned repeated attempts to post such content. So the developers are saying, well, if this was targeting an individual, we would have put a stop to it. But apparently Apple, that's not good enough for Apple. Also muddying this issue, uh, Apple removed the Quartz News app from the App Store in China, not in Hong Kong, because the Chinese government said it violated local laws. The Quartz website has been blocked in China as well. That's probably not shocking. Quartz has been reporting on the Hong Kong protest. New York Times is blocked in China as well. Earlier this week, Apple removed the Taiwan flag emoji from iOS 13 for users in Hong Kong and Macau at the request of the Chinese government. China doesn't consider Taiwan a separate country, so they don't think it should have a separate flag in the emoji set, even though it's a standard. And if you're thinking, well, that's all Apple, Google pulled a game called The Revolution of Our Times, which is part of a slogan from the Hong Kong protests, from the Google Play Store. Now, keep in mind, Google Play does not operate in China. The game let users play as Hong Kong protesters. Google said that it was, quote, prohibiting developers from capitalizing on sensitive events, such as attempting to make money from serious ongoing conflicts or tragedies through a game. So imagine if uh, it was a Pearl Harbor game right after Pearl Harbor. I think more recently, you know, if it was a, a World Trade Center game right after September 11th. That That's sure. kind of what yeah. that policy is for. And Google's saying that this is close enough that they're going to pull that. Uh, all of these are being seen as China having its say over what U.S. tech companies do, Justin. And I know you've done a lot of talk both on politics, 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 as well as TMS yeah. uh, about this. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've alluded to the NBA situation uh, as well, where the NBA is losing some lucrative contracts right now. We don't know where that's going to go because the commissioner stood by the Houston Rockets GM's posting, even though that person deleted it. Uh, this, where, where are the lines here? I mean, some of this feels like, well, we're just obeying local laws. Some of it mm, feels like maybe it's not. These stories, to me, feel like things that we are paying a lot more attention to because we saw the NBA story, because the South Park episode happened, because the uh, blizzard uh, banning of, of Blitzchung after he made a Hong Kong statement during a Grandmasters Hearthstone uh, tournament. These are echoing stories because, Tom, you know very well, on DTNS, we've covered stories like this where uh, apps disappear or go away or aren't launched in China all the time. The fact that 
China has decided that quartz is no longer cool to be uh, displayed if you want to play, uh, you know, along with the government is the same as them deciding the New York Times shouldn't be there. This I mean, is- and Daily Tech News Show not available in China because yeah. we cover China in a way that China doesn't approve of. Uh, uh, which, I mean, at that point, thank you for notice, noticing us, Senpai. But, yeah, seriously. Uh, the, uh, uh, this, to me, is an echo. Uh, I don't believe that this is necessarily totally out of bounds for how Apple has handled stuff. Are they capitulating? Yeah. I mean, I think on a certain level, we need to understand that when you are making money in China, you have to understand that this is a different world and we have a, we have a right to be uncomfortable with it as american customers we have a right to ask of something better or different from the companies that we buy products from but this is not new if anything the last two weeks to me and and this hong kong protest and and everything that's kind of come from it is is i'm i'm thankful that from an american perspective we now just have a little bit more of an idea of exactly how china plays with its foreign allies, uh, specifically in the corporate world. Yeah, I, I, when you look at these cases, uh, certainly if you want to make a case that tech companies are are being too easy and giving into China, you can make that case out of these. Uh, there's no doubt that you can. If you look at them in isolation, each one of them has a plausible deniability to it. Revolution of our times might just be considered to be like bad taste, right? If this wasn't China and Hong Kong, if it was protests somewhere else, uh, maybe Google pulls it too because they're like, that's just not okay. Don't don't make don't make yeah. light of this situation. It's and a very so, serious we, situation. We also we also don't know exactly the the mechanics of that. I haven't played that, the game. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. That, that's uh, another element. As you mentioned, quartz getting pulled. No surprise. That's de rigueur. I'm surprised. I was surprised to find the quartz was available in China up until now. To be honest. Uh, but this other stuff with Hong Kong Live, I think the fact that Apple was like, mm, probably not, well, maybe so, oh, wait, maybe not, shows that this is a complex issue that there is not one answer to, uh, that you you are helping people that you may agree with by publishing it. You're also hurting the police, and you're dealing with the Hong Kong government, which, yeah. while controlled by the Chinese government, is not the Chinese government. Uh, so... While you may not want to annoy the Chinese government, uh, you also plausibly can say, look, the local police, let's say this was, you know, Austin, Texas, the local police in Austin said this app is endangering our lives. Look, our officer was targeted and wounded because of this app. And Apple said, you know what, this is too much. We're pulling it. I don't know. Would would this be the same sort of conversation? Because that's what's happening. The Hong Kong police went to I- Apple and said this is a, 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 an endangerment app. Yeah, I, I think that that's the other thing about the HK app or the, the HK Live app is I don't know if there was a New York City police tracker that, that that would survive in the app store for for very long. Especially if there were disturbances going on in New York yeah. at the time, right? Uh, what if this this was a tracker in Ferguson a couple of years ago? Yeah, I mean, I mean, was, incendiary, incendiary. Yeah, uh, a, a different conversation, certainly. One, one very, very last quick thing. Uh, I, I do believe that these are compounding issues. As, as we mentioned, I think these are echoes of larger things that have happened. Uh, almost assuredly, this has been touched off because of these Hong Kong protests. And also something to just keep an eye on is the fact that, look, China is an, author, uh, an authoritarian regime where there are no free, there's no big elections where the Chairman Xi, who runs the country, is decided on. This is the 70th anniversary of the Communist uh, Party. This is a very important thing. They just got done with their National Week. They just got done, or sorry, Golden Week and National Day, which was the actual day to commemorate it. Uh, this is a sensitive time for their leadership, and there are a lot of things that are happening around it. I am not surprised that China is pulling the chain on some of the uh, relationships they have with the West. One last thing, uh, if you are going to send us a comment on this, uh, don't send us a comment that there are speed tracker apps allowed in the U.S. There's been a lot of controversy of that. Yes, Waze can can tell you where the speed trap's at, uh, but that was not an easy decision. But if you know of some more interesting examples of tracking police in the U.S. apps, let us know about those. We'd love to hear that feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. A lot of these stories are submitted and also voted on at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Join the crew. Also, we're on Facebook, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. Sean wrote in about our conversation yesterday about uh, 
You know, what What do people understand about privacy in the U.S.? Sean said it was sort of bemoaned in episode 3634 about the low percentage of people that understand HTTPS, meaning an encrypted connection. I'm not surprised about this because Chrome has gradually hidden a lot of that information. Sean says, for example, if I open up HTTPS colon slash slash www.google.com in Chrome today, Chrome only shows a lock icon and google.com in the address bar. Both the protocol HTTP or HTTPS and www are all hidden, but Chrome does show not secure for HTTP sites. If you're paying attention, you do know that. But I think he makes a good point that, you know, this is obfuscated for a lot of folks. Well, and in that Pew study, it said uh, people don't recognize HTTPS, but maybe they recognize the green icon, you know, the green lock yeah. icon. That's a good, that's a really good point. Uh, shout out to patrons at our master and grand master levels who keep us going really strong, including Adam Carr, Andy Beach, and Martin James. Thanks to y'all, and also thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. What's been going on, uh, you know, in a very slow news week? <laughs> we have uh, <laughs> the opposite of that, obviously, in the world of politics, both uh, uh, domestically and internationally. So I would encourage everybody to come on over. Just go ahead and uh, uh, listen to the first five minutes of the most recent Politics, Politics, Politics episode. Uh, I've uh, I've really enjoyed where we've gone. And uh, if you want something a little bit more accessible in your email box, let's say, every morning, you can sign up for my free political newsletter at freepoliticalnewsletter.com. Five stories a day, uh, uh, five days a week, mostly gifts, sometimes hot takes. We have new Patreon rewards. Become a member of DTNS and get a peek at our show rundown as we develop it. Or uh, maybe take place in behind-the-scenes chats. I was recording my editor's desk today in front of a live studio audience in the backstage channel in the Discord. And on November 1st, everybody who is at the $2 level or above will get a PDF copy of the official DTNS cookbook with recipes from the show hosts and even some listeners sign up right now at patreon.com slash dtns if you have feedback for us we would love to hear it feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails we're also live monday through friday 4 30 p.m eastern that's 20 30 utc and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live back tomorrow with annie gauss and len peralta talk to you then this show is part of the frog pants network get more at frogpants.com Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>